Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Lee Carroll, welcome, welcome. It is so great to be with you. And I want to talk to you about when first open contact with benevolent extraterrestrials will occur for humanity on Earth, when it will happen, who it will happen with, and how this possibly intersects with shamanism. So I'd like to start with you. Big question right up at the start, which is once open contact occurs, how will they communicate? Will they use English? Will they use another language, telepathy or telepathy, that a a word a lot of people use? What kind of communication with otherworldly beings will be like? You make the assumption that they have, have, uh, you know, they're in a closet someplace and they're not. You realize they've been here for hundreds of years. They probably all know all of the earth languages. Um, Some have said, well, they won't use language because they're going to use telepathy because they can't talk and all. I would like to be a lot more practical in all these things. I think they they know us. They uh, many times they love us. You know why they're waiting, don't you? I could go through that as well. We they've been here for hundreds of years watching us. We are still too dangerous. And that is why they haven't contacted us. And they will when all of this is settled. And that is the prophecy of the new earth. And when they do, my I think they may even like land on the White House lawn and introduce themselves in English. I mean, it's, it's that practical. I don't think we have to make it more spacey than, you know, we're a product of movies. Um, I think they know our language. If they don't, they can interpret it. They have, they're ready. They're ready. They have been for a long time for us to get with it. Agreed. A hundred percent. Yes, we are dangerous. Uh, There's a lot going on humanity against humanity and some terrible crimes and wars and things against planet Earth. And it is heartbreaking indeed. And so they're waiting and assuming that at some point we will get it together, hoping that we will get it together. Once undeniable open contact occurs with humanity, how do you perceive that it's going to change us? I think that we're going to be able to get, have them. They, I think they're standing by to help us. I've always felt that. And that they can't do this until we settle down because we're very dangerous. They have things that we need now. Now, we are on the cusp of finding them ourselves. If Again, if we could settle down. It, have you ever noticed how inventions are given to humanity when they need them? It's, I mean, uh, you know, when flight occurred, uh, we only, the Wright brothers only beat the French by two weeks. In other words, it's almost like everything is, radio was the same way. Everything is given all at once. That almost sounds like, you know, somebody came down and gave us the ideas when we needed them. I am a believer of that. And I believe that we need the uh, 12 base math. I believe we need um, new physics. And what we don't have right now is multidimensional physics, awareness of conscious dimensionality. Most people think that high and low consciousness is just the ability to think differently. It isn't, in my opinion, it's always been a dimensional shift. And so it's uh, people of low consciousness cannot think above where they are. Um, Once you have a higher consciousness, you can look backwards to where you were. So it all tells you that a higher consciousness is, is may actually have a different physical attribute. It may be a dimensional place. So we uh, are taught, and my channeling has said, that there is tremendous benevolence coming to us from the stars. And that when they would arrive, they will be very high consciousness. It is another dimensional aspect of physics itself. And that they're going to give to us as well. There's much that, that we are ready to receive. We'll also, I think, discover that there's a system. There may be a plan. There may be an association. There may be agreements. There may be treaties. We're just in the dark because we're still barbaric. We're alone. And we don't, we, you know, we've come to the, 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 I think, classically, the earth and its population has come to understand 
we are not alone, no matter what our governments tell us. <laughs> so we won't be frightened or something. We know better. You just you just look up into the stars and see the potential for what we have here. It's everywhere. And you have things like the Kepler experiment showing a billion planets like ours out there. It's there. But we are not ready. When they arrive, I think they have gifts for us, really. And this flies in the face of most movies. It flies in the face of what we are we're taught. We put on them who we are, low consciousness. So we expect them to take over, to steal from us, to eat us, to all these things. This is what we expect because this is what we would do. <laughs> Understand? We put on them who we are, low consciousness. What if it were just the opposite? Hmm. Thank you. Yes, that is very thought provoking and powerful. We are not separate from them. However, we're very different from them. They are advanced civilizations. What about them being us in the future? Is that us in the future? There's many um, who have, it's, it's like, it's, I, I think it's really esoteric thinking. Uh, for instance, am I also somebody else at the same time in another dimension doing something else are there layers of me that go almost to um infiniteness that are multi-dimensional is there another earth doing what we're doing in another dimension when we think of that there is of course that possibility i don't think it's honoring of spiritually of our soul i think there's one soul I think we're here and we are actively working with it. I believe in multidimensionality, but I don't believe that they're necessarily um, alternate realities with me in them or them in them. I think that we are all together as a oneness. That is complicated in itself because we don't have that concept. We don't have multidimensional concepts. We are very 3D. So it's tough for us to think beyond what we think we can do. Let me give you an example. Since we were children, we were told God can listen to a billion prayers at once. And we're always going, that is impossible. That's just, I mean, God can do that because God is God. What if it were actually doable in another dimension? Because we just don't understand it. We don't understand how that can be. Now we're, starting, we're looking at things like entanglement and realizing that voids all the laws of physics we've ever known, even as kids. There's a lot we don't know. So that is probably where we're getting that idea that there's a lot of me's out there or lots of them's out there, or we are them in the future. It's possible. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Considering that one day this will occur, and certainly in my timeline, I, I pray that is so, that the benevolent beings will come. Do you have any sense who they will be? And anything about that scenario, but especially who they will be. I, I have my belief, and it doesn't necessarily translate to anyone else's, mm -hmm. but we have been given this information, a group of us. Now you, I know, are also invested in studying channeling. Mm -hmm. So if you take a look at the channelers of the world, even in the last 20 or 30 years, there's a consensus that we were seeded by the stars we didn't come from anything here. That our DNA, our 23 pairs, is not what was, uh, there was a demarcation point about 200,000 years ago, according to biologists, we didn't come from here. So somebody seeded us. Now that's what we expect. And that might be the Pleiadians. It could be, and they're very close by. It could be the Syrians, it could be the Octorians, it could be, and what we are looking at is the potential of multi-cascading seeding. For instance, let's say it was the Pleiadians. They may have been seeded by the Octorians. They may have been seeded by the Syrians over a million years or so. And what it boils down to is that we're all family. So your DNA right now is not from Earth. I believe it's from the stars. And if you look at DNA like we look at it, there's an inheritance sh scheme there. That means you might be from the Orion, you might be from Syria, uh, Octorians. All of these benevolent high consciousness beings looking at us saying, 
you need to know a whole lot more about the truth of this universe. There is a benevolence here that you didn't expect. You're calling it God. It is spiritual. It has to do with your soul. And now here's the truth. That's what I, I firmly believe is going to happen. I think it may very well be from um, Syria or Pleiadian. I think we have multiple seatings. <laughs> so, but I love the fact that the consensus is that for, we're from the stars and not from here. Now, that's, that's pretty woo-woo if somebody just tuned into this. But there is some science going on now that are looking at the firm disconnect of a 24 paired human being as opposed to a 23 paired chromosome human being. What happened, how it happened, there's no link to us past 200,000 years ago. We're not from here. Mm -hmm. Yes, Francis Crick, who discovered the DNA and also won a Nobel Peace Prize for it, said his quote, that the human DNA is way too complex. It's impossible that it is from Earth, and he believes it's celestial seeding as well. I agree. And then Greg Braden's book, Human by Design, as a scientist, he tracks backward to all the disconnects that we are, we are saying connect. And, and there, we really are, uh, that, that's textbook. We're connecting them um, by inference, not by science. So we, we think we've come from here or there, but we haven't. And science is showing we really didn't. So Crick was right. Not only just complicated, but when you take a look at what happened from 24 to 23 in that era where they said the change happened and they have the evidence, you have chromosome 2. The chromosome 2 pair, it's a meld of telomere to telomere. That can't happen by itself because telomeres are on the ends, not the middle. And chromosome 2 has become the compassion. It's responsible for our compassionate action and all manner of things in our brain, it just makes sense that that adjustment had to be made and it comes from the stars, in my opinion. Now, I know it's controversial, but the longer I live, the more science I'm seeing start to indicate it might be so. Yes, indeed. And I'm so curious while you're saying that, Lee. So if that's so, we're seeded from the stars. We're, we've actually got the advanced civilization. We're probably a beautiful mix because each civilization, even that you named, was birthed from another civilization. Mm -hmm. Then we have people like the Yael and the Gael and their hybrids from us and other civilizations. So with that in mind, why are we here? Why would we make a choice to come into this incredible density and difficulty right? There's a lot of joy here and beauty. There's things to love and be grateful for, amazing life. On the other hand, being human is difficult. And all the things you named earlier are exactly true, the barbarism that we are living in. And so why? Why did we make this decision or why was it set up this way instead of just being a beautiful advanced civilization here on earth? I think there is a test at hand. It's a test of energy. I think that it is spiritual as well as, well, if you take a look at this whole thing we're talking about, it, it, it all is spiritual. <laughs> I think you're dealing with very high consciousness universe way before Earth. You realize Earth, life happened on Earth really late compared to the rest of the universe. It's just the way it works. So we are, we're just a kids, new kids on the block. What if we had to prove ourselves? What if they had to see where their consciousness would evolve by itself and then we were one of the family? But spiritually, you know, you have kind of the seed of it as we were kids and told about the Adam and Eve story. I think that spirit put us here as a test of energy to see whether we could climb out of the darkness and, or whatever and find the love that was here. And the reason why that we just weren't put here a certain way that's just that's just the way it's just part of the plan i think that at some level through our own conscious free choice as human beings we had to create it instead of it simply placed upon us mm -hmm. yeah well i'm going to shift to shamanism and start to tie this in is there anything about the practices of indigenous people of the shamans 
that is in connection to the extraterrestrials at all. I'll just leave it very open-ended like that. We have an entire course on the, I'd say the premise where that is part of the premise. We believe that when we first got here, that we actually had teachers from the stars to get us going. Now, this is what Crian has told us, and they were women. And that is the other thing, or females as we see that. And this gets us in trouble, gets us in controversial. We believe that women should be the shamans of the planet. They should be the priests and the pastors and all. They're the ones with the compassion. They're the ones that have kids. They are the ones with patience. And instead, it developed into men. We think women do a much better job. All of that to say that we believe that when we first arrived here, the Adam and Eve story, that we got help. We got, we got a a manual, if you wish to say, of how God works, of what to, of how to act and, and what, what we can do. And that is part of shamanic training. We also believe that that were the first shamans. And when we take a look at what shamanism is, I believe it is a higher dimensional thinking where there is an awareness of more than most people see or know. And you can be trained into that if you are patient and with somebody who can, can take you there, a shaman. I look at the indigenous shamans and I am so grateful that some of them are still here because you can just look into their eyes and see the wisdom of the universe. They know how things work. And I really appreciate it and I celebrate them. And I want to, I want that for everyone. And I believe it can be that for everyone. So you might think of our spiritual um, seeds themselves, all of them as shamanic. And when they arrive, I think we will see that in that too. They're wise, they are beautiful, they are comfortable, they are kind, they are caring, and they've come here to show us that. That's shamanism. Yes, what you said is entirely correct. And thank you so much for the belief in women, for the knowing about women. Shamanism began in Siberia. And the first shamans, I love how you have put it in the past on this show, you said Shaw women. <laughs> and so using your term, Shaw women or shaman, the first ones, the inception of that in Siberia were women. They were the bone setters, the midwives. They knew how to cure the sick and they knew how to go into trance, into the dream state. And what happened over time is the men also wanted to partake many, many moons later. And they did. They started to also learn how to go into trance in dreams and otherwise using plants and so forth. And this is exactly why the Siberian shaman dress like women today. Yeah. Right. It's the inception of that. It is. And just to set everybody straight, because if you if you read Monica's book um, <laughs> and all that about the women of Lemuria, we are only saying that women make better spiritual leaders. We're not saying they should be the leaders of the planet or they're better than men. And we are told that in civilizations way back then, the men honored this, they loved it. It's like no man today just wishes they could give birth. I mean, they don't want to be something they're not. And there was an acknowledgement, and I'm sorry, don't write letters that women do it better. <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to say those things today. We're supposed to all be the same. We're also, be, you know, and we're not. Folks, we're not. There are things that men do better. There are things that girls do better. And shamanism it, and taking care of kids and taking care of uh, just in general, in caring, women are better. Mm. And so we look, and, and may I just say this, and here is a soundbite from Crying's channels over and over. When the man is lying wounded on the battlefield and the blood is is pouring out of him and he knows he's going to die and there's 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 all around him there's this incredible noise and crying and all he calls on his mom not his dad that had to tell you a lot hmm. with everything that you have just said lee and the fact that they're waiting for us basically the benevolent extraterrestrials are waiting for humanity to get it together 
And I know we don't have to be squeaky clean, but they are waiting for us some semblance that we could actually sustain benevolent connection, commune with them. What do the shamans have to teach us? What are they already doing? What do they already know? That if humanity were to learn from them, follow them, uh, absorb some of their practices or beliefs or ways of being, what do the shamans have that we actually need? You may disagree because it's extremely nerdy, what I'm going to tell you. They need to finally show it that this earth needs base 12. Now, base 12 is the math of the universe. It exposes the physics we don't have now. It exposes how to do things that we, have, we don't think we can do now. Egypt is one of the only civilizations we know that had base 12. And I don't personally believe that the ETs came down and built their pyramids. I think that they were savvy enough. They may have been given base 12 by the ETs, but they did it themselves because they had the knowledge. Base 12, I'll tell you one of the things that Crian said about base 12. He said- Will you explain what base 12 is for anybody who doesn't understand that term? We, we count in tens because we have five fingers and five toes, five, 10, 15, 20, whatever. Imagine that scenario being in 12s instead. And imagine what well, if you were in a mathematics, there's there's reason, there's all manner of factors that increase when you start with 12. And the Egyptians had it, they used to count their knuckles and fingers. And that's how they did the, you know, the thing that we do on the hands. What it does, it's a mathematics which opens, um, it's, a, it's a language. Math is a language anyway, it exposes things. And it exposes things that we don't know about or can't do. And I have never even thought of this is if you talk to a mathematician, they'll tell you that mathematics is a language and the, the more you get into it, the more it exposes other systems and things and patterns. And this is the math of the the structure of the universe is 12. I mean, I could I could give you um, fact after fact after fact, for instance, uh, are you intrigued with the fact that music is in 12? How about our clock? Uh, how about uh, the degrees of the of the earth, the 360 degrees um, on and on and on. And then my favorite, because I'm a, I'm a nerd. If you take out any memory chip of most of your cameras, you can look at the number on the chip and it's divisible by four. Now, the reason that happens is because memory chips, it just kind of fell there naturally. This is how it developed. They didn't design, uh, you know, a five a five twelve k chip. Or these are numbers that happened automatically in the in the sequence of the way things fall, and that's how they got there. There are many things that tell you twelve is the operative number of the planet. Crian said, unless you have base twelve, you're not going to get to the stars. That tells me that there's physics hiding that we'll never get when we count on our fingers and toes. It's just not going to happen. Back to the Egyptians. If you take a look at what they had besides pyramids, they had aromatherapy, they had sound healing, they built sound chambers, they did all manner of things which would seem to be very high consciousness solutions way before we were ever looking at it. They were healing with processes that we are just today discovering all, I believe, because they had the, the uh, attributes of base 12. It just lays there. It just points to it. And of course, the civilization itself lasted for 5,000 years. There is so much to look at there. So this is one of the first things they're going to show us, how to reframe our entire system of of mathematics so that we can discover the physics that we don't know. And are there things that the shamans do? Do they connect already with our star family? Do they connect? Have they been connecting throughout time and history with our interstellar emissaries? And do they have relationships with them? Relationships totally. that probably humanity wouldn't understand. Yes. And what we take a look at with shamans, especially indigenous shamans, when they start talking, we tune out because they start talking about a dimension that they're visiting. 
sometimes to collect information and come back, sometimes just to tank up and to get that which they need to to dispense wisdom. But they always go there. And if you talk about what they're doing and if they verbalize it, they're often in another place in order for this to happen. So they're already aware of dimension shifting, of being in, in an, in an uh, I would say, a dimensionality that isn't here in order to then get what they need for here. Now, that shamanism is already beyond our physics. It's, uh, mo- it's metaphysical, beyond physics. They're tapping in to what we are going to be shown how to do. How do they do that? How does how do the shamans travel? And I understand this is a very 3D question. So let's see if we can move past that. So if they travel past this dimension, if they travel away from this reality, does the shaman leave his or her physical body behind? Do they use a wormhole to travel with their soul? If the shaman's soul leaves their body, does it become the size of a particle? Or is it all thought or otherwise? It's actually none of the above. (laughs) We're back to being 3D biased. If you've got to go from California to New York, the first thing you think of is two places, right? All right. Let's say that I'm going to contact New York with my brain. And somebody says, well, how do you do that? How long does it take? What vehicle do you use? What happens when you're there? And are you blank while you're here? All of those are, are um, I could use many words. They're biased questions in three dimensions. Crying says we're three digit dimensional beings and there's multi dimensions. We are in black and white and physics is in color. And so the answer is this. We're just discovering entanglement. Do you know how it works? Do you know what, what, what it the attributes are of entanglement here they are you have a particle on mars you have a particle on the earth you touch the one on the earth the one on mars moves you are one with the particle on mars now that is physics and it's called entanglement so the shaman doesn't have to go anywhere it's already there you simply tap into it And so all dimensions exist all at once. We are one with all of them. We are just not aware of them. A shaman is aware of more than we are, is able to be in that dimension at the same time they stand there. They don't have to go anywhere. They don't need a vehicle. Nothing happens to them here when they're there. And you can see it. You can see it work. Some, some have said the, the ones in India used to glow <laughs> when they did this. And so we see this through history. There is a dimension that they, they access while they're here. They don't have to go anywhere, just like entanglement that we are seeing about and learning now. It's so far from what we can conceive. You don't know what you don't know. You can't think beyond what your thought train tells you what you've trained or what your mathematics is or anything you've learned in school it's tough for us to go beyond that which we believe or have seen but it's true what if you are a multi-dimensional being all dimensions are inside you but you only have access to a few what if you have a mind like a shaman which might have been inherited from other shamans it could be trained it could be worked on that allows you to simply expand yourself and visit all those dimensions that are already with you. You see? What do you anticipate when this connection actually happens with the benevolent extraterrestrials? What are they going to bring to us? What will it be technology? Will it be communication, wisdom, just relationship? What do you know? I believe the first thing, uh, it's going to happen slow. First of all, people know they're there, but because of the um, bias of our films and everything else, they'll, uh, the first thing, there'll be an enormous amount of people who believe uh, that they're conspiratorial, they're here to hurt us. And it may take um, many years, 
for the people to understand and realize. And that's going to be with with a start. The, the reason that they may start with technology is to show us they want to help us. And so we can suddenly grow food in ways we never were before. We can make electricity in ways we never could before. They hand us physics that will help us have a better life. And so with a number of years like that, and they finally realize that they're kind and benevolent, then the next phase, I firmly believe, is a rewriting of what we think God is. <laughs> because our perception of God is us, if you've thought about it. The Heavenly Father in the sky loves us, but also punishes us, just like our fathers do. And so you have a punishing, vindictive God. That is the God that I was taught is there who loves us so much. We don't mind our manners. We're going to get tortured. You know, what kind of a God is this? And so it starts to rewrite what the concept of the creator of the universe might really be pure love a multi-dimensionality not a father not a being that loves us i think that they're going to be able to extend our lives i think they're going to be able to be the ultimate shamans and that's how it's going to happen in my opinion and slowly and do you anticipate, or has Cryan said that we will change by, this seems like a nonsensical question, so forgive me, but still with curiosity to move this conversation forward so people can start to envision, to ingest this, not as a possibility, but that this will indeed happen and it will be a beautiful thing to invite into our lives how will it change us? What are the possibilities? You mentioned some beautiful exchange of technology that we will start to understand that there is a God, but not the way we've been perceiving, you know, much greater idea of God. And frankly, then that means that we're a much greater version of us than we had understood previously. So what are the ways that humanity can start to see? It's like, you know, when you're marketing and you say, here's the the benefits and why to do this, mm -hmm. what might that be? I think it boils down to a life of compassion, kindness, love, caring, and that um, the earth itself would look at one that, you know, there's always duality. There'll always be people who disagree. There'll always be people who want to do it differently. And they'll all that, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean we can't be kind to each other and compassion to each other. It's not going to be a magic wand that makes everybody go, oh, I have always been told that in metaphysics, everybody was expecting a wand to come down and we'd all be, you know, walking around in white robes. And <laughs> this is not the case. It's it's a humanity, number one, that won't kill itself and won't go to war no matter what. But we'll find other ways to work with each other. And the basis of that is compassion and kindness. Now, that requires a human being thinking outside of what we were taught. So we don't battle each other. We understand each other. And that is probably one of the biggest things they will bring. So we're, it's a shift of dimensionality of consciousness, if you want to think of it. Klein has even said, history, ancient, if, if you can, it, I'll take you a thousand years out. You'll come back and you'll see this point in time is the end of barbarism. And we've got, we've got till 2030, even till the end of the precession of equinoxes, even to finish this phase. This isn't going to happen soon. But you know what I like, Debbie? We're talking about it now. And we are figured out that we're not from here. We have figured out that there is benevolence coming to us, not horror. We have figured out that there are those watching us who care about us. That's number three. All of these things are remarkable compared to 30 years ago. We just had something that's happened in these last couple of years, and maybe people have caught on to it. Maybe they haven't. This is not your grandfather's world. The wars you see today did not have the effect that those who created and participated in them thought they might, especially the ones who started them. They thought that you'd have the same thing happen in our grandfather's world. You would have an alignment of sides, east and west. People would take sides, take arms. You'd have another, you'd, you'd take it right back 50 years ago to the Cold War or even a World War II situation. And there are those who are invested in war. 
in ancient times, this is what just fueled all the economies. We have a civilization that only warred. You'd have one major war, everybody goes to lunch, and you have another one. It's almost like we never learned from the past generation. This generation we have, it's different. Because when these wars break out, and they broke out now, you, it didn't instantly have all of the countries in the planet take sides and do what they had done in the past, where you have separations that are political, physical, and uh, it just didn't happen. Most of the earth looks at it and goes, stop the fighting. What can we do? We're not joining you. And that's different. When, when Switzerland decides to take, to, you know, to, to not be neutral on this, you know something's changed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, yes. How can we embody a way of being and relating and being stewards of the earth? What specifically st stories, examples, what are we not doing or seeing? How can we start to be that to protect the earth, to show up for the great mother Pachamama? I think if you look at what we've all done and had to do with ourselves is to ask the question, no matter what we've been taught, no matter what we believe, is there something bigger we're missing? That is a question that is very soul searching. If you were raised in a certain religion, it's hard for you in the belief that you have to say, is there more than I was told? Could it be different from what I was told? And so you have to get beyond yourself and ask these hard questions. Because what will be revealed to you at that point in time is that there is more and there's a lot more and maybe it's different than you were told and maybe it's better than you were told. The first thing I learned is that we are born magnificent. We're not born dirty like I was taught. That as a human being, my self-worth is ingrained. It's my lineage. I have a choice to go in the other direction I want to. And that is low energy, high energy. I can be a victim all my life or not. But when I sat down and asked the question to spirit, whatever you believe in prayer or whatever, dear God, dear spirit, is there more than I was told? Show me. That's when I started getting shown. It's almost like I had to ask the question. So in answer to your question of what can we do, the first thing, the big word is allowance to change. You're not, nothing's going to change if you hold the same attitudes that you always have had, the same beliefs you've always had, because it puts us right into the same old energy. I ask for allowance for parents all over the planet to ask themselves, no matter what your parents taught you, will you continue to teach hate? Will you continue to teach who did what to whom and why you should dislike them? Or will you start thinking about what you're saying to your children and saying, here's history, but here's how we can change it. So it's tough to undo things that we were taught. And that's part of what we must do in order to get to this next phase of belief. You got to have allowance to know there's more instead of simply expecting somebody to come on down and touch you and change everything and make it right. We got to do it not somebody else. Mm -hmm. I know that you're familiar with the shamans. I know you've spent time with them. And I'm curious, what specific practices do shamans have that we could adopt that would really help us to be the change that you're talking about? Most of the shamans on the planet, my favorite, Nicholas Picard in Peru, talked about the, um, the cosmology of his tribe. And it, it was so funny because as I heard him talk, it was this cry on 101, the, the, uh, the entity that I channel. And one of the things that he said was critical in the cosmology of, of um, his people was you have to understand the alliance with Gaia. Because Gaia is a partner in all things. Most people just think, well, I'm a tree hugger. I'm not. It's nice to know the planet. What if it was an integral part 
of our dimension, of our belief? What if it was an integral part of awakening that the planet itself has a sentience that we need, that we need to understand and agree with? And here's what he did that I'll always remember. He comes from the Kiro tribe, which is doesn't even, it's um, the precursor of the Incas. And he reached down, and we were in together and just sitting at his feet. He reached down and he picked up some dirt and he put it on his lips. And then he began to teach. And I said, what have you done? Oh, and he said, oh, he said, these are my ancestors. They're in the dirt of the earth, you know. That's where we go. You know, this is where you bury them. This is where you cremate them. They're in the dirt of the earth, all over the earth. And he says, I have just picked up the wisdom of the ancestors and put it in my mouth so that I can speak to you with their wisdom. Wow. <laughs> and then I got it. Oh, I am starting to get it. We need to associate with the sentience and dimensionality of this beautiful earth of ours in order to even save humanity itself. What would the, well, let's, uh, I'll, I'll go with this. You talked about the fact that we are connected to the extraterrestrials and also that that's a very hard concept for us, that we are basically infusing ourselves projecting ourselves onto God, onto other people, onto other beings from other planets. And sadly, we don't yet have anything outside of Ancestry.com or 23. We can't test those things. And I actually think that's what I'd like to do. But galactic history, galactic history of the human soul. Can you talk a little bit about the real history of who we are? Go a little bit deeper into that. I really can't. And I'll tell you, there are those who can and those who have been shown the whole lineage, all the cosmology with names and dimensions. That isn't me. My thrust and what I ask people, what you're into and what you're thinking about right now, how does it help others around you? And so never have I ever gone into those places and Crian hasn't shown me those places because he said you can get so involved in them and they're so fascinating and interesting that you're no good to anybody. <laughs> and I understand that, you know, and you, you see that even today with somebody who's possessed with a certain thing and, and, uh, and you just, you know, what do you want for lunch? And all they want to do is talk about uh, football scores or something. <laughs> so, you know, it's, they're not helping anybody else. So that's my thrust. My thrust is, may, does it help anybody? What are you doing every day? And it's not that you shouldn't be interested in these things. You should be because it's the future. But don't let it possess you to the point that you're not helping. You know, gather the compassion that you're starting to learn. We're going to become a compassionate race someday. That's what they're going to give to us. What if we started practicing now, even if we don't know what, our, what we're doing? Can you love? Can you, can you forgive? Can you change your attitude? Can you do something really hard for you and that forgiving for somebody who's betrayed you? Why don't you start right now? This is, this is what we can do. This is the precursor. This is the kindergarten we need to do before they get here. What do you understand that visitation will be like when it does happen, when it is undeniable? Do you have any understanding or has Cryon given you any indication of how that will look, how that will be for us, that it will be undeniable? What does that look like? If you're looking at 3D and you've watched the movies, you'll say, well, they'll take over every television channel and say they're here. I don't think so. They don't want to be frightening. The last thing they want to do is create fear. Fear stops love. They are here to show us there is love in this universe for us. So it'll be quiet. It'll be benevolent. It'll be peaceful and safe. I don't know, <laughs> but it's got to be all of those things. A shaman will tell you the same thing. This is what they're invested in. Compassion, kindness, healing. It comes from a place of being peaceful, self-worth, knowing who you are 
and then sharing that with others. That's what they're going to have to do. And mm -hmm. I don't know how they're going to do it. Maybe from their wisdom, we'll see it happen and go, oh, never thought of that. Yes, oh, I love that. Can you offer us here some downloaded wisdom from the extraterrestrials as a benevolent collective, a message to us as humanity, what we really don't know and need to know? The universe is teeming with life. If you take a look at science, they know it. Even NASA, the Jet Propulsion Lab, and anybody who designs spacecraft right now going anywhere in our solar system has a life detection kit. We expect to find life, even microbial life. That is a message that says even our scientists know that there's life out there. The Earth is the babe in the woods. Our life started very late. Therefore, all around us is a far, far grander set of life entities that have been there, done that, and have millions of years more than we do. They've discovered what the creator of the, of the universe is. They have multidimensional compassion. And it's not necessarily every single one of them, but it's most of them. There's something that they would like you to know. Earth actually is protected. Now, there is something that most don't know. We're protected from those who are not benevolent, from visiting and doing things that are not benevolent. We are watched over in a way that says we are ready when you are. Wasn't it, wouldn't it be something to think that there's a family out there almost all of them humanoid like us the reason for that unlike your movies is that the physics is the same all over this galaxy the chemistry is the same all over this galaxy so life starts the way ours did develops much the way ours did so you're going to get the same thing uh, ours created instead of you know <laughs> 14 arms and three eyes Mm -hmm. You're going to see what you recognize, maybe a little taller, maybe a different color. But it's going to come, and when it does, they will come and say, well, finally, you're ready. They're here. They're just waiting for you to get it together. And so I say to people, benevolence is coming. Color is coming. And you might say, well, not in my lifetime. And I'll say, so what? You're coming back. Remember, your lineage is this planet. Do you realize <laughs> that more of the earth believes in reincarnation that, that, than that doesn't? So just because you don't think, you weren't taught in your church that there's reincarnation, just take a look around at who believes it. It was the first intuitive system on the planet and the, the organized religion that was there, if you want to call them even organized, Hinduism believed in reincarnation. It's intuitive. We were just simply talked out of it. So you're coming back and you're going to be a wise old soul and participate when they come. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And Lee, if Mother Gaia, Mother Earth, the greatest mother of all, beautiful, resilient, powerful Earth, if she could say something on any of this about the benevolent extraterrestrials or, or about herself or about humanity or all of the above, what do you know she would say? Please come and meet me. I'm part of it all. And the shamans who are dismissed throughout history, persecuted, <laughs> really mistreated. What? If they could say something as a collective, what would the Shah men and the Shah women say to us? This was prophesied, expected, it's about time. <laughs> That's what they would say. And I've heard him say that. And this is what Nicholas Picard said, because he came down from the Kiro tribe uh, under much criticism, learned Spanish in Peru and started teaching what he knew. That's what they're, they're saying. It's even um, our own um, precious... Uh, American Indians are saying, we are releasing some of the secrets because it's time and we feel you're ready. And in the past, we weren't ready. 
and now we are. So there, there, there's a lot more trusting and they're seeing um, even people like me, as white as you get, <laughs> saying, you're okay now. So we're, I see, we're seeing a lot of different things going on with the shamans who are beginning to trust us more. Absolutely. I studied under Dr. Alberto Viotto for six of months. Course. Of course. Yes. And received my Four Winds certificate as a shamanic energy healer. I've since yes. taken other courses and I know of the Quero okay. people. And um, so regarding the prophecy, and I think something you said was very important when you express that they are sharing with us now. These are practices they didn't, not that we were open to them before, mm -hmm. but now they are coming into Western society. Can you talk about that? Because I think that's um, it's a very beautiful act on their behalf to have been so persecuted and yet to still share. What is the purpose in the sharing and are we ready for this information and for these practices? Let me answer that by giving you a story. I think it'll answer it all. My channeling is now in its 34th year. Started in 1989. In 1995, I had my first of seven invitations to go to the United Nations and give a channeling. Not in the major hall that they do, but in one of the committee rooms. And delegates and guests of the UN were invited. So it wasn't a big meeting. I think we only had about 60 people there. That was the first of seven. Brian said two things that I will never forget. And both of them relate to you and this program and what you're studying. Number one, this was 1995. Brian said to all the nations who could listen to that channeling, open up and tell what you know about those who visit us. That was number one. <laughs> 1995, the second thing he said, there should be a non-voting indigenous council of wisdom at the United Nations to help you with what you're trying to do because you won't be able to do it without them. Now it was very careful, Klein said non-voting, so they're not political. They wouldn't have a vote in what was doing. They would simply be advisors, shamanic advisors, to the United Nations. Neither of those things were seen as anything but laughable or eye rolling at that point in time. Now here we are. How do you like the United Nations so far? What have they done recently? And you start to wonder whether those things would have made a difference. I still think they would have. Now maybe it's too late. Maybe there are other things that we should do. But in an indigenous council of wisdom for the planet, that's what Krein asked for. So I know that's not a direct answer, but it gives you a whole idea of where I am. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, the Dalai Lama was asked, so what about the star beings? <laughs> and he answered, oh, they're fine. Thank you. <laughs> I, I asked Nicholas, the shaman in Peru, I said, uh, how did we get here? <laughs> and there was this big pause. What's your creation story, my friend? And really, truly, he sat back. We were at dinner and he sat back and I were interpreting because he doesn't speak English and he used one word in Spanish, intervention. So even the shamans know this and are aware of it. <laughs> Lee, here at the end, last question. Is there anything you want to say to wrap this up? Any wisdom or illumination or information about first contact, when, who, who we are being, who we possibly could be as humanity, mm -hmm. and how shamanism intersects with all of this? That's a That would be a big, a long discussion. Shamanism intersects with high consciousness, period. We call them shamans. They're just high consciousness beings that are in touch with multi-dimensions. So are the ones that are coming. And so you're going to see a, uh, a time when the shamans come, <laughs> if you want to say that. And that's, that really truly is how I believe it and, and how I see it. So I tell everybody that 
although it may not be tomorrow, it may not be in your lifetime. It honestly might not be, depending upon your age. But you're going to see it anyway. Your children are going to see it. Get them ready for it in a way to say, color is coming in a black and white world. When they come, don't be afraid. They're out there. They love you. And they're watching you now. And may I ask when you say that, got to throw this question in. Is it possible there are different timelines? Is it possible that there are timelines where this actually happens in two years, but for some people, because of their behaviors and beliefs, et cetera, it will it, not happen in this you timeline? Know, there, there has to be that, only because when Einstein started looking and telling us that time was a variable, it's, a, it's actually a dimension. Yes, it has to be. I don't want to go there because we don't understand it, and people take it ways that are not um, in intelligent. And so they say, they immediately say, well, I'm going to be one of those ones where it won't happen. This is human nature, you know, because I did something wrong. We don't even go there because people take <laughs> people go go and, and take all the negative things they can and apply them. So I'm in my timeline. Thank you. I'm staying in my timeline. Thank you. It's the only one that I know about. Thank you. And I'm going to exist there in love and compassion. Yes, you're going to stay in your timeline lane. I'm going to stay in my timeline lane. I love it. Lee Carroll, thank you so much for bringing all of this to us today. This was really extraordinary. And I appreciate so much the contribution to this project, yes, but also to all of what you agreed to do in this lifetime. It's massive. You touch so many people and you've certainly helped me on my path. I am very grateful. Debbie, you're here at the right time, the right place, with the right information. You couldn't have done this 30 years ago. The technology was not there. The information would not be accepted. You are very much part of all of this as well. Many thanks. Many blessings. <laughs>